and we are live. Hey, what's up, New Zealand and the world? Lucas Lawman's Kiwi Voice here with Matthew Haig from Frontline Law. We'll do the usual Kiwi voicing and we'll wait uh, 30 seconds or so for a few people to jump on. But as per usual, this will be up on the page permanently, so you can watch it anytime you like. Thanks for joining us, uh, Matthew. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, how's the weekend been? Uh, wet in Wellington, Lucas. Thanks for having me. Yep, excellent. Oh, so you're, you're up in Wellington now? Yes, I am. Yes, so we've spent the last 10 days uh, down in the South Island traveling around and arrived back nice. about an hour ago. So back at home is good. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. So based in Wellington. Yeah, I just came up. Obviously, I'm sitting in Blenheim in the, in the hotel room here. And she was getting rather squally, et cetera, on the, on the way up. It's starting to look pretty dark and pretty menacing. And uh, my understanding is we've got two or three days of that. So mm. Wellington's the epicenter, I think, as well, isn't it? At the moment it is, yeah. Good New Zealand weather. Yeah, awesome. All right. So we've got oh, we've got almost 30 people on just like that. Okay, so we'll get into it. Excuse me. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Once again, if you just jumped on now, it's Lucas Lawman's obviously here with Kiwi Voice. Uh, we have got Matthew Haig from Frontline Law here to have a bit of a yarn with us about the uh, the cases that have gone through the courts that have ruled uh, the NZDF and police uh, vaccine mandates as unlawful, what's all that's all about. Um, so thanks, Matthew. We should probably jump into it, um, get the conversation going. So tell us all about the case, if you can, um, you know, from go to woe, how did it all come about? And if there are any key moments, any of that stuff, go for your life. Sure. Yeah, and I've been told it's long form, so I'm going to be uh, awesome <laughs> with my answers. Um, awesome. So, awesome. yeah, look, this, this started, as everyone knows, two years ago when the pandemic started. And when the pandemic started, it was an emergency. People, I think, accepted that on the whole. Um, we expected the government to take steps to keep people safe. Fast forward 18 months, and I, I wanted to make that point because we weren't at the beginning of the pandemic. We'd spent 18 months with COVID-19, and that's a long time. It's a long time yes. for the government to listen to expert advice, to listen to their citizens and to make some well-informed decisions about what laws and safeguards to put in place to protect us. So in December 2021, uh, last year, uh, the Minister for Workplace Relations and Safety, Minister Michael Wood, um, mm -hmm. made the COVID, uh, the workplace vaccinations order and the specified workplace vaccinations order. And in effect, what that order did was it required members of the police and the defence force or the armed forces specifically to be vaccinated or lose their jobs. Yeah. Um, it was, a, as with most of these vaccine mandates, it was a blanket order. It wasn't aimed mm. at certain people in high risk positions. It, it affected yeah. everyone, whether or yeah. not you were working in an MIQ or on the border or with vulnerable people, it affected everyone. And so I was engaged by United We Stand, uh, which is a really interesting group of New Zealand Defence Force members and police officers, and I think their supporters, including their families. And they asked me, well, what can be done to challenge the, um, the order that the ministers put in place? Yep. And there's really only one answer to that when it's a, a, se a piece of secondary legislation like, like this was, and that is judicial review. And okay. a judicial review is when we ask the High Court to scrutinise an official's decision, and in this case, it was the decision to make this order, um, and scrutinise its lawfulness. And if it is unlawful, then the High Court has the ability, in the case of secondary legislation, to set it aside. So our um, challenge was on a few different grounds. Um, okay. We we got creative, um, as creative as we could. We, we sort of took a bit of a shotgun approach, as tends to happen with judicial review. Got we you. had to work fast, and we we were instructed, I think, on the 6th of, no, it was very late December 2021, during the Christmas break, um, and we ended up filing in the High Court on the first day of the High Court was open for normal business on the 6th of January. And that's, um, if you've ever had um, involvement with proceedings before, that's a very, very short time frame. Gotcha. And the reason we worked so quickly um, in United We Stand wanted that to happen was people were going to lose their jobs. It was going to happen uh, at the, from memory, the end of February. Okay. And so we yep. had to move quickly. So we yeah, got it yeah. in front of the High Court. Um, we asked the court for an interim order to prevent be people being discharged or terminated before the matter was determined by the High Court. The High that Court. Yeah, um, it's to pres preserve their position. The High Court worked 
uh, to find a hearing date that was prior to the date of termination. So they sort of said, well, we don't need to give you the interim order because we found the state that gotcha. we will hear the matter and determine it before people start getting fired. Great. So um, we were happy with that. Sure. So we had the hearing um, on the, and I'm just going back in my memory, it was uh, mid-February from memory we had the hearing, and it was on the same day as the grounded Kiwis case, which is interesting. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah, that was, yeah, that's good timing, yeah, because that was a big one as well, wasn't it? It was. So same day, same yeah. court in the Wellington High Court. Right. <laughs> um, so we, we went forward. It was a one-day hearing. It was very much focal, focused on the legal aspects of it. Um, all evidence was given by way of affidavit. So we didn't have the minister sitting in the seat being cross-examined. That's not what judicial reviews tend to be. Okay. So we got through the day. Um, the court, to their credit, turned their decision around quite quickly. And on the... Uh, I want to say the 25th of March, they released the decision and we were successful. And the court mm -hmm. uh, found, and I'll, I'll read the exact words that... Um, yeah, awesome. Awesome. He, he sort of concluded with, this is Justice Cook on the Wellington High Court, said that I conclude that the order does not involve a reasonable limit on the applicant's rights that can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society and that it mm. is unlawful. Sure. So good result. Um, yes, Absolutely. Yep. We, got, we got notified um, by email from the registrar. There was an embargo on that decision for only two hours. And the idea yep. was is that the court didn't want mainstream media outlets um, sensationalising it because they wanted to be first to print. They wanted the media to have a chance to read it before they started putting breaking news banners um, on the internet. Gotcha. Um, so two hours later, it was publicised. Um, and this was the first time in New Zealand that a the High Court had ruled that a workplace mandate, a government mandate, was unlawful. So it was first time ever. Decision. First time ever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, and what's happened since since that ruling? I mean, it was widely circulated through both mainstream and alt media. Probably a little bit further down the list on the on the mainstream media side of things, but definitely was widely circulated. It was touted at some protest, etc., as quite a significant victory. But what's happened since the end of that? Yeah, so um, I think the government were, were a bit shocked at the outcome. Uh, they There wasn't a lot of public comment. And you'll remember that the Prime Minister had her post-Cabinet briefing and she announced a few changes with the mandates and vaccine passes and border requirements for entry. Yes. And she very generously said that the government has decided to withdraw the police and defence force mandate. Um, generous because the High Court had a week before ruled it to be unlawful. So yes. the Prime Minister has <laughs> yeah. to do what she has to do, but it, it, yeah. it was a bit unnecessary in my view. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so about four weeks later, right at the end of the appeal window, I think literally on the last day of the day they could appeal, they put an appeal into the Court of Appeal. Um, it was it was simply a notice of appeal, and they described the ground of appeal as they didn't think that Justice Cook considered what they called, and he called the precautionary principle. And that's when pretty much there's an issue of public health and it's an emergency. The High Court um, is careful about how they scrutinise and weigh evidence up in that context of a public health emergency. Gotcha. The problem for the government was, if you read the judgment in Yardley, um, there's about three or four paragraphs dedicated to the precautionary principle. So I don't know why they said that he hadn't considered it when it's um, yeah. really a page of his judgment where he does consider it. Yeah, and gotcha. About two months after they uh, appealed the judgment, they abandoned their appeal. Right. Um, right. So effectively, what that means is we won, they abandoned their appeal, and it's not going to be overturned. Yeah, so Chris Lynch touched on this when you were when you were talking to him, and it would be good to get your thoughts on that again. Do, do you think that appeal was just because they felt like they should save face? Yeah, look, I, I think I do. I think there's a few different reasons. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that there was a political and a public scrutiny aspect to this that, yes. that was a factor in their decision to appeal. Yes, I do think that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, is anything happening? What's happening? Or not is anything? Probably a better way to put it is what, what is happening now with it? So that it's been ruled unlawful, as I said, touted as a bit of a victory, and, and you guys would be rightfully, um, you know, stoked about the fact that you've got that outcome. So, so what happens now? Do people get their jobs back? And, and what's at, at that point? And what's going on now? 
yeah so so that's exactly right what's next and yeah um, so there's two distinct groups here there's a group of police officers police employees and there's the members of the armed forces so those people in uniform working for the defense force in the case of the police um they have largely got their jobs back um nearly all of them are back in their job and those who aren't awesome. and usually um for for various reasons including the sort of the hurt and the the breach of trust and the betrayal that they saw happening yeah. have chosen not to go back there yeah, is some work to do with police and we're, we're going through a process with police um an employment process to try and make that happen but what i would say for police is that they have moved in the right direction there's work to be done and we will do that work but they're moving in the right direction sadly yeah, i can't absolutely. say the same for the defense force um okay. and okay. you know I, I think i can be justifiably strong in my language on this one sure, um sure. the chief of defense force has time and time again pushed a vaccine mandate and it's either held to be unlawful or in the face of a challenge he is backed down and this started right back in december before my involvement there was a uh, chief of defense force directive that people be vaccinated another lawyer yep. challenged that and then they um put in place the government mandate effectively over um displacing the cdf directive so in my view that was an acknowledgement that the cdf director was unlawful as yeah, we know the yeah. next one was the yali decision we won that was unlawful there was another one um only two weeks ago where we judicially reviewed another cdf directive that he had made after the yardley decision it was effectively a vaccine mandate and after we commenced the judicial review he rescinded the directive again an acknowledgement i think that um mm. it was unlawful and he's just done it again a week ago. Um, he's put in place another instrument, another one imposing a vaccine mandate, and we've yet again challenged it again. And yeah, this, is, right. this is the fourth time round. And what my really clear message to CDF is align yourself with every other public service organization in New Zealand, um, act lawfully, get proper advice because mm. we don't want to be in the high court again no one does it's not a fun place for the people who only want to do their job um yeah i just I, I wish that he would take a step back and reconsider and take a reasonable proportionate and lawful approach yeah so there's two things that i would i would ask about that sort of things then um firstly uh, i just wonder what the what the motivations are, are there if it's so repeated uh, in the face of these legal challenges but but secondly uh if it is deemed as unlawful uh the, the mandate then how can he how can he is he no is he no um uh, prosecution what's the what's the deal with that yeah I, I think the first, you know, what is his motivation? I, I don't mm. know the answer to that, mm. um, but but I know that it's not to comply with the law because again, yeah. this is time number four that we've challenged him in the high court. Mm. Um, only he can answer that. What I hope yes. is that opposition MPs, members of the public, family members of affected defence force people will contact the Minister of Defence, will contact the Chief of Defence Force, the Prime Minister, just reach out and email them and say, we don't like the CDF treating his people unlawfully. And this is not just my opinion. The High Court has said again and again that, mm, uh, mm. in the case of the Yardley decision at least, that um, the Minister's directive was unlawful. In terms of your second question, um, accountability. Look, I yeah. think the, the legal system has its limits. Um, we're we're testing some of those limits we're, we've asked yeah. the high court to scrutinize these orders and regulations and they've done that and we've been largely successful um i think ultimately the accountability for the cdf and for the prime minister and for the minister of workplace relations is political um right. cdf is a political appointee he's been extended for a second term i, d I don't think that's entirely healthy i think that it's good to have <laughs> change senior leadership positions oh, um, at any organization i agree yep I think so. I think that mm. um, CDF being a political appointee is inherently close to the government of the day. And I, th I think, in my opinion, this particular CDF is very close with this government. And yep. the ideological commitment to vaccine mandates has influenced this chief of defence force. And, th and that's maybe part of the motivation for his gotcha. actions, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, the ideolog ideological side of things can be uh, quite strong with people. Now, on, on that, or certain people, so on, on that front, um, oh, okay, now I'll, I'll stick with this side of things, actually, Matt. So tell us a bit uh, about the revelation that, that you came across there, that the government were, Michael Woods particularly, were trying to hide some information that would have been seen as being useful to your case or um, positive towards your case. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that, that was a revelation, and... Um, mm. 
you know, these, these long form interviews are great because we can um, go into a little bit more detail that hasn't been yes. shared publicly before. Um, so the workplace vaccination order, originally its purpose was to prevent the spread and transmission of COVID-19. That was its purpose and it was enacted on in December and that was its purpose until two days before the hearing in the High Court. Two days before the hearing, I got an email on my phone saying, um, actually, we've made a um, drafting error and the purpose is completely different. The purpose is, in fact, to maintain, you know, in effect, the operational capacity of the Defence Force and the New Zealand Police. Right. <laughs> so it was not to prevent the spread and transmission of COVID. And so that, that sort of is context for... Um, uh, some information that the, the government gave in their own evidence. So the Minister for Workplace Relations, um, as part of his evidence, he gave cabinet letters. So cabinet um, notes that he, he had drafted, him and his team, and had provided to cabinet because it's cabinet who make the decision, decision about the vaccine mandate. And in his own notes, in his own evidence, he, and I'll read this word for word. Um, awesome. Said, Given public health advice is that it is not justified to mandate vaccination for any other workforces at this stage on public health grounds alone, Crown Law have advised that the reliance on the public interest ground must advance a pressing and substantial objective. Goodness. So what I'm saying is that in December 2021, before December 2021, this is in November, his own advice from his own experts was that these mandates were not required for public health reasons and and to me i mean that isn't that the whole justification that we've been yeah 100 percent yeah. people safe team of five million all the rest of it and in this case he had gone ahead after receiving the advice that was not justified on public health grounds and and to me that's um it's embarrassing for the governments i, I think 100%. it shows that the decision was wrong and they pursued their ideological commitments despite public health advice to the contrary yeah, which, which is crazy when we all know and we've all had different experiences, whether friends or family or otherwise, of the division that it's caused uh, from a societal perspective, relationship perspective, um, that sort of thing. And it's been widely documented now. It's accepted um, as being a, a, a an effect of what's happened through these mandates, etc. And yet they would continue to push that. It's uh, it's quite astonishing to, to hear, even with expert advice, that that was the case. I'd like to ask you, Matthew, as well, um, on a couple of things, and it would be your opinion, um, potentially from a legal or personal or both perspective, um, around the existing mandates that remain in place. That will be the first one. Obviously, we've got a health, the health industry, border workers, I think, are still mandated. Um, do you see that as having the same uh, structure or same potential for challenge if someone was to do so, or do you think there's a different justification being the industries that they are? I mean, yes, there is a different justification. So the purpose for the vaccine order, which is for health workers, corrections, um, border workers, MIQ workers and other people, is to prevent the spread and transmission of COVID-19. And that was challenged in the NZD SOS and NZT SOS cases. So a group of doctors and yes. teachers challenged that in judicial review. Um, that was in the Wellington High Court. They were unsuccessful. They challenged it on similar grounds to what we did, and the okay. lawyers did a great job. Um, they did everything that we would have done. Um, it was not any fault in their strategy or technique. It was simply that okay. because there was a different purpose for that order, the courts said that, look, if there is some evidence in support of that purpose, even if the evidence is contradicted by other evidence, even if that evidence is not compelling, if there's a something there, that's enough for the court to say that it's lawful. And whether right. we agree with that or not, um, yeah, is yeah. the approach of the court. And that's where I'll go back to the limits of the legal system. Um, yep. it, the High Court is not a place to resolve scientific disputes. Yes. Um, ultimately, this is a political question. And ultimately, I think that question will be answered um, at the next at the elections next year. Yeah, 100%. Hey, look, that's awesome, that clarification that you've given us there, because that is a question that floats around a bit. Um, you know, that ma that makes sense to me. Whether, again, whether I agree with the actual scientific evidence around it or not, it doesn't really matter. Just around that case, that's awesome clarification uh, from a legal standpoint, so I really do appreciate it. 
Um, okay, so we've covered off most of what I would like to get through there, Matthew, but um, tell us a little bit more, probably a good place to finish off uh, and go into as much detail or information as you like around uh, United We Stand. Um, uh, what's that all about? Um, and, you know, obviously they were part of the group that, uh, well, they were the group, sorry, that you represented. So give us a bit of a spiel on them. Sure. So United We Stand um, is a group of New Zealand Defence Force and New Zealand Police people, men and women who serve our country in some cases for decades. Um, these are men and women who have served operationally overseas. Um, they've they've really dedicated their lives to serving our community as New Zealanders, and that means something. I think this is not an yes. ordinary job, and I think 100%. that because their rights are limited already by the nature of work they do. You know, if you're in the armed forces, you don't get to say no to your boss. You do what you're yep. told. Because of that limitation on rights, there needs to be extra caution when the government's imposing these mandates because you need to treat these people lawfully. Um, they've already sacrificed a lot of their rights in service of their country. So but yep. you need to be very careful about how they how you go about limiting further rights. So Look, the United We Stand group, um, they've got a website, unitedwestand.nz. I'd really cool. encourage people to go on the website, have a look at who they are, have a read of some of their blog posts. Um, there's, You can support them financially if you want, and I'd encourage that. I would say mm -hmm. that um, I'm not technically part of the United We Stand group. I'm a lawyer who works for them. The money goes gotcha. to them, not directly yep. to me. Um, nice clarification. I yep. legal services. So no personal profit of this. It's simply a group that I really support and I think have done a great job in supporting the men and women of the New Zealand Police and New Zealand Defence Force when the government did not. Yeah, awesome. And what we'll do then is, uh, yeah, look, and, and myself personally, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers will be 100% uh, behind a, a group like that and what they do, we'll chuck a, a link to the website up in the description of this live once it's posted. Um, so look, thanks heaps, Matthew. That that is awesome. Um, really appreciate. We have that's just gone so quick. We've gone through twenty two minutes already. Um, so really do appreciate you uh, going into so much detail for us. Um, and I encourage you if you're uh, if you're keen, brave enough to jump into the comments later on once the video is posted in about five minutes after we finish. Um, if you want to and see any of the comments in there and and get involved with the conversation, we try and keep things as open as possible here on Kiwi Voice. But, um, yeah, thanks again for your time. It's been awesome talking to you, and uh, I'd like to keep in touch for uh, any further developments down the track if we can. Thanks, Douglas. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.